Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Nutritional Considerations in the Era of GLP-1R Agnists. I'm Leslie Samay, Director of Professional Development at Great Valley Publishing, and I'm the host for today's show. Before we get started, I have three points of housekeeping. In order to claim your credit, you'll have to remain with us through the entire hour-long presentation. Second, if you have any questions, please use the comments box on the left-hand side of your screen to send your questions over to us. We'll try to address as many questions as time allows. Finally, nutritional considerations in the era of GLP-1R agonists award one CPEU in accordance with the Commission on Dietetic Registration's CPEU Prior Approval Program. And now on to our disclosures. Jonathan Clinthorne, PhD, is an employee of Simply Good Foods USA, Inc. Kristen Kirkpatrick, MSRD, is a consultant to Quest Nutrition, the practitioner on record for eVitamins.com, a health coach for Prolon, and a consultant for Jetson Health and Concrete. Funding from non-CPE revenue for CPE planning, development, review, and or presentation has been provided by Simply Good Foods USA, Inc. And now I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Jonathan Clinthorne and Kristen Kirkpatrick. Jonathan Thorne received his doctorate in human nutrition from Michigan State University for his work focusing on the intersection of diet, metabolism, and immune function. His research has been published in several top-tier journals, including the Journal of Nutrition, Frontiers in Nutrition, and the Journal of Immunology. As the Senior Director of Nutrition at Simply Good Foods, John is involved in new product research and development, creating continuing education courses, and establishing relationships with healthcare professionals. Kristen Kirkpatrick is a registered dietitian with over 20 years of experience in integrative nutrition. Kristen has spent her entire career as a dietitian at the Cleveland Clinic Department of Wellness and Preventive Medicine. She's a best-selling author of two books, Skinny Liver and Regenerative Health, and she's an, exper an experienced presenter and an award-winning dietitian. Kristen serves as a contributing writer for Today.com, Eating Well Magazine, Costco Connection, and Cleveland Clinic Health Essentials. And so with that, now I'm pleased to turn it over to Dr. John and Kristen. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Here are our learning objectives for today. And I just have to say, as someone who did their doctorate work studying energy metabolism, this is a topic I could talk about for hours and hours, but we will try to get to the point here today and jump right into our agenda. Uh, quickly, we're going to give an overview of this new class of medications that has become such a societal phenomenon, talk a little bit about their history, some of the landmark clinical trials that have really demonstrated their efficacy, what's known about how they actually work, and maybe some of the public health implications that are out there from who is receiving these medications, and then also talk a little bit about some of the nutritional considerations that should be thought about for this specific patient population. And then Kristen will share some case studies and actually walk us through how she is coaching and counseling patients who are using this class of medications. So one of the things that has struck me is a lot of people talking about the GLP-1 receptor agonists as if they're brand new medications. And they're usually surprised to find out that exenatide is actually a GLP-1 receptor agonist that was approved in 2005 for the treatment of diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And one of the unique things about exenatide was that it's relatively short-acting and has to be injected twice daily. And this is quite a bit different from the newer drugs that are out there, things like semaglutide and terzepatide, which are much longer acting versions of GLP-1 receptor agonists and only require a weekly injection. There is an oral version of semaglutide available that is only FDA approved for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And the ones that are highlighted in yellow here are actually FDA approved for the treatment of obesity, whereas ones that are not highlighted are, have only been approved for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Not to say that you might not run into patients who are using a version that has been approved for diabetes off-label for losing weight as well. Uh, what's interesting to think about is that because we now have medications that are approved for the management or treatment of obesity, we actually really expand the patient population who are eligible for GLP-1 receptor agonists. And so if you use the inclusion-exclusion criteria from the STEP or CIRMOUT trials, which are really what established the efficacy of these medications, 
uh, you see about 93 million Americans are actually eligible for this class of drugs. And in 2023, prescription rates increased by over 2,000% year over year. So they are certainly becoming quite a bit more popular. Now, the hallmark trials that really demonstrated their efficacy specifically for weight loss for semaglutide, this was the STEP trials. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2021. And then we had terzepatide, which are these surmount trials. And this was also published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2022. And these are really the, the landmark trials that truly showed the efficacy. So one of the things to understand is that these have been cited thousands of times, really showing how this is changing the conversation in obesity medicine and academia. What makes these medications unique is that they are what are known as incretin mimetics. So incretins are gut-derived hormones generally released upon stimulation from nutrients. Whenever someone consumes a meal, you see incretin levels rise, things like GLP-1, GIP, peptide YY. And the newer class of GLP-1s are specifically designed to activate that GLP-1 receptor. What makes them different is that they're actually very long-lived. So semaglutide, for example, has a half-life in the body of about 160 hours. That makes it much more effective than naturally produced GLP-1 or endogenous GLP-1, as it's known, which has a half-life in the body of anywhere from two to five minutes. So Yes, we can eat foods that can increase our GLP-1 levels. However, that's not going to have the same effect as something like semaglutide. What also makes these medications unique is how they work. They work on multiple different areas of the body. There are GLP-1 receptors throughout the digestive system, some in the brain, some on muscle, and other anti-obesity medications, things like fentramine, bupropion, uh, those target mostly only the brain, whereas Things like metformin target the liver, Orlistat target the digestive system. What's unique about semaglutide and terzepatide is that they target the brain, the digestive system, the pancreas, um, and even some research pub that was presented at the ADA's 2024 conference showing that they may even change gene expression in taste buds and then influencing how taste perception works. Looking at the STEP-1 trial, and this was the 2021 trial published in New England Journal of Medicine, semaglutide was given to a group of patients who did not have type 2 diabetes. So this is specific for weight loss in this case. And one of the things I like people to understand when you're looking at the semaglutide data, they, patients are brought through a dose escalation phase. And when they go through their dose escalation phase, this can help get them to what's called the highest maximal dose or highest tolerable dose. When they get there, they are maintained at that highest tolerable dose and then kept there for uh, generally the rest of the trial. What's unique to see here is that when you have patients who are being brought onto this dose escalation phase, this tends to be when side effects are most predominant. So if you look at the table on the right, you can see the different levels of side effects. And we also brought in some data from the surmount terzepatide trials showing how common some of the GI-related side effects are, specifically nausea, diarrhea, constipation, vomiting. And those things really are predominant during this dose escalation phase and then tend to go away or go down as the patient becomes more acclimated to the medication. We also have the surmount trial, which was done with terzepatide. So in the step one trial with semaglutide, we saw about 15% of body weight lost over the course of a year, quite substantial. Well, with the terzepatide trial at the highest dose, you saw about 21% weight loss over the course of a year. What's unique about the terzepatide trial is that they actually used three different doses of terzepatide. Everyone went through a dose escalation phase, but some people's maximum tolerable dose would be five milligrams, 10 milligrams, or 15 milligrams. And you can see even at the lowest dose of terzepatide at five milligrams, you still had approximately 15% of body weight loss. And 
terzepatide is unique in that it's both a GLP-1 receptor agonist and a GIP receptor agonist. So this is a molecule, a single peptide, that's able to activate two different receptors in the body. And it's believed that by activating the GIP receptor, it actually may help reduce some of the GI side effects while still strongly activating GLP-1 in order to reduce hunger and uh, increase fullness. So how effective are these medications compared to what else has been out there? And I think this is important for helping understand, again, some of the nutritional considerations that we should be thinking about. When we look at lifestyle modification, things like diet and exercise, intensive lifestyle counseling, typically anywhere from 6 to maybe 10% on the most intensive lifestyle modifications uh, for overall weight loss at six months to a year. With the second-generation anti-obesity medications, things like fentramine, bupropion, and naltrexone, uh, typically somewhere in the 8 to 10% body weight loss. Fast forward to semaglutide and terzepatide at their highest doses, you're seeing anywhere from 15 to 21% body weight loss at, after one year of treatment. Uh, Retitrutride, which is a triple agonist and is not yet released or FDA approved, actually saw almost 25% weight loss in their uh, clinical trials, suggesting that it's starting to approach the efficacy of bariatric surgery. Just to put things into context, these are much more effective than past interventions that have been available, but it also should make us be even more considerate of what type of nutrition that folks are consuming because they're con going to be consuming so much less. Now, I also think it's important to take a quick look at how these medications change people's eating behaviors. And, and this is probably the best trial that's been done on this. There have been several where they infuse people with GLP-1s, and then they will actually look at uh, acute feeding behavior changes, whereas this trial actually took people through the whole dose escalation protocol and then had them, um, had them actually report different food cravings and different consumption patterns, and looking at the effects of these medications on overall hunger, certainly significant decrease, increases in fullness, and then what I think is interesting is the second half of this table, looking at more specifics. So non-significant decrease in cravings for chocolate, non-significant decreases in cravings for sweets, maybe even a slight in uptick in cravings for fruit and fruit juice, but significantly fewer cravings for dairy and significantly fewer cravings for savory foods. Um, to me, that, that's pretty indicative of how we can help counsel our patients, how we can help counsel people who are using these medications. If you're concerned about someone's calcium intake and then you're recommending that they eat more dairy, that may not be actually an effective recommendation for somebody using a GLP-1. What is starting to come out is that the response to this class of medications is not homogenous. It's actually quite heterogeneous when you look at the patient population and who's a responder and the degree of a response that they have. So this was actually some data that was broken out to look at different categories of weight loss and what percent of patients using these medications were achieving these different weight loss milestones after one year of treatment. And what they saw was that there's actually about 10 to 15% of people who are not losing greater than 5% of their body weight when using one of these medications. So again, we hopefully see a 5% weight loss or greater in order to see the clinically meaningful benefits of, of weight loss in obesity. And so there are some people who are not even quite getting there when they're using these medications. If you go to 10% weight loss or greater, which uh, there has been some, some evidence that you actually need to lose greater than 10% of your weight loss to affect certain aspects of obesity-related comorbidities, and there's anywhere from 25 to 30% of people who don't actually achieve that 10% weight loss at one year or greater. So again, these medications are very effective, but they're not very effective in everyone. There are definitely some people who can benefit from additional counseling and additional support. Some variables that are associated with successful weight loss or, or higher degrees of weight loss include higher starting BMI, people who had more weight to lose tended to lose a greater portion of their body weight, starting glycemic status. Um, all these studies were done in people who did not have diabetes, but if you actually look at the weight loss 
in the diabetes literature with the GLP-1s. It's not, they're not as effective in people with diabetes. So there's something to do with glycemic status that influences the efficacy. And then sex is also a, a determinant factor in weight loss success. In fact, there is actually so much data out there on semaglutide now. It, it was approved in 2017 for diabetes use. Um, so there's been quite a bit more longer term studies. This was a nice nugget that could be pulled out of one of the cardiovascular studies where they actually looked at the difference of the effect of sex on weight change over the course of the treatment protocol and found that women actually lost more weight when they were using these medications than men. So you may encounter patients who have unrealistic expectations or who are curious about um, using a, a GLP-1 and it's important to help them understand how their own personal factors may affect the success of treatment for them. Now, when we look at the overall efficacy, again, there is so much data out there around semaglutide because it's been around for longer. This is a two-year study. There's actually four-year data available now. Um, when you look at this longitudinally, I think you can start to see a certain trend come out in that there's almost three specific phases of weight loss or treatment when you look at this. And so you certainly have the steep linear weight loss that occurs during dose escalation over the course of 20 years, over the course of 20 weeks. And that's really the dose escalation phase. Every four weeks, you increase the dose. Um, that's, that's where almost half the weight loss tends to occur with semaglutide. And then for the next 30, 40 weeks, uh, your continued weight loss during dose maintenance. So how much weight continues to be lost, but the curve is definitely not nearly as steep. And then by 60, 64 weeks, 65 weeks, you start to see weight loss actually plateau. And for the next year, these patients don't generally lose a significantly large amount of weight at all, um, suggesting that, that there is somewhat of a homeostatic mechanism in place where the, the body is now starting to try to maintain its weight at a certain level. And for a lot of people, um, this is very clinically meaningful weight loss, but patients may still expect greater results. I think I heard one interpretation where it was essentially you have patients starting at a BMI of 38, their BMI gets down to 32. It definitely reduces risk of many different comorbidities, but a patient who has a BMI of 32 may actually have a goal of, of lowering their body weight even more, and they may not have gotten there. I also think it's really important to point out that the GLP-1 receptor agonists do not fundamentally cure obesity. So um, while these are very effective when you are on treatment, when you discontinue treatment, there's a high likelihood of weight regain. And this is the uh, surmount trial where they put people on terzepatide for a 36-week treatment phase. They took them through dose escalation. And then at 36 weeks, they took the whole popula population and randomized them either to begin receiving a placebo injection or continue with a terzepatide injection. The people who were receiving the placebo injection then um, were followed for their body weight as well as the terzepatide group. And they saw the terzepatide group continued to lose weight, whereas the placebo group began to regain body weight. And now, I think it's important to talk about the mechanism the methods that were used here, right? You randomized people to a placebo injection. You didn't really tell them, okay, you're going to discontinue. Let's see how your body weight stabilizes. So it's not like these people made a conscious choice to discontinue and try to maintain their weight loss. Um, nonetheless, you can see that there is a return of hunger and a return of cravings that occurs when people go off of the medications. And this was with terzepatide. There has been similar data done with semaglutide showing that um, people regain about two-thirds of the weight that they lost within one year of discontinuing semaglutide. Demographics are important to think about. There has been several groups who have looked at electronic health records to help understand um, who actually is the patient population out there, who is using these medications, and what are the indications that they're using them for. And there are definitely certain trends that have come out. Number one, it's predominantly a female patient population. Um, there is definitely something that's skewing at least 60% or greater for the percent of patients that are female. And then the patients who are using these remain predominantly people with type 2 diabetes. In semaglutide, it's at least about 50%. In terzepatide, about 75-80%. 
of the patients who actually have type 2 diabetes who are using those medications, but the group of patients who are using these as anti-obesity medications is growing. And that's where actually the largest growth in um, prescriptions is being seen. Now, there is some specific data for semaglutide 2.4, which is only approved for uh, obesity management and weight loss. And that patient population was reported to be 81% female with an average age of 47 years old, an average starting BMI of 38. And uniquely, 75% of them have never tried an anti-obesity medication treatment before, so they would not have tried phentermine or something else like that before. What does the future look like here? I think that's a very interesting question. I hear a lot of conversation that maybe this is just a fad, this is a trend, we're in the GLP-1 craze. Um, I, I would say that there are a lot of new medications that act on or behave like incretins in the pipeline. And it makes me believe that this is not a fad and that they are not going to go away. I think it actually increases the importance of understanding how nutrition needs to be tailored for this patient population and could really highlight the pivotal role that dietitians play in not just facilitating weight loss, but helping facilitate healthy weight loss or um, helping facilitate quality weight loss. Just to look at the pipeline for medications that are coming up in the future, um, there are medications that will be continuing to just target GLP-1 receptors, uh, including a higher dose of semaglutide at 7.2 milligrams, oral GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, there are GLP-1 plus GIP receptor agonists, not just terzepatide, but several others are in phase one clinical trials. There are monoclonal antibodies that are going after the GLP-1 and GIP receptor. There are also triple agonists. As I mentioned, retitrutide is a triple agonist. Then there are other dual agonists that will be looking at both GLP-1 and glucagon receptors, or even targeting additional incretin mimetics such as amylin or peptide YY. So a lot of these trials are also beyond their preclinical and phase one clinical trials. They're in their phase two or phase three clinical trials, indicating there is quite a bit more coming. We also should talk about discontinuation or persistence. And I think this entire conversation is a little clouded right now due to the price and availability of these medications. But there has been a lot of work done looking at electronic health records where they are seeing that uh, discontinuation rates specifically for people using these for obesity management tend to be anywhere from 50 to maybe as high as 67% at one year post prescription. So these are quite high discontinuation rates. And they've also compared that to people using it for type 2 diabetes or type 2 diabetes plus obesity and seen lower discontinuation rates in that patient population. So there seems to be something more specific to uh, people using this for weight management who may need actually more support or more recommendations there. I also think it's important note to note that um, people who are living in underserved regions and people with health inequities also tend to have higher discontinuation rates. So it might be something to look out for as you work with patients or clients around how you can support them in this space. The concern with discontinuation is several fold. The number one is, is you know, people are looking for how do these actually improve the cost benefit equation for insurers and healthcare providers, but also there's physiological concerns that when people go on these medications and lose weight, they will lose a significant amount of lean mass. And then if they discontinue, we've seen what happens with rate, weight regain. It's actually quite rapid within a year, significant amount of body weights regain. And that this might have long-term implications on body composition, as well as increasing rates of sarcopenic obesity. Now, some of that initial conversation started because when the step one trial was published, that's the semaglutide trials, a small subgroup was analyzed for the amount of lean mass that they lost during the weight loss phase. And they found that 40% of the mass loss during that one year was actually lean mass. And so that raised some alarm bells for some folks saying that's actually the highest end of what you'd expect during weight loss. Anytime people lose weight, you expect to have some lean muscle loss, um, but that was, was quite high for what you'd expect. 
However, there have been further analyses both on retitrutide, which is a type 2 diabetes population, or the terzepatide data showing that it doesn't seem to be quite as extreme. It's either the effect of the medication or we just had an artifact from using a small subgroup in the semaglutide trials. Nonetheless, anytime someone's losing weight, we still should be thinking about how can we direct them to quality weight loss. And so several expert consensus papers or, or guidances have been put out, published, got the references at the bottom of the slide if you're interested in looking at these more, around what should be considered for people who are losing weight, regardless of how they're losing weight, really. Uh, but anytime people are losing a significant amount of body weight, what do we need to think about? Um, first is tempering lean muscle loss. You know, lean muscle really does help us maintain uh, our basal metabolic rate. And then in older patient populations, decreasing risk of osteoporosis, falls, and injuries. One recommendation there, um, we know that protein needs to be sufficient and that protein should be dosed in perhaps 20 to 30 gram increments with high quality protein spread throughout the day, and that it really should be combined with resistance exercise. Now, GI issues are the most common issue that occur and are reported by patients with these, uh, either constipation or diarrhea. And so, you know, soluble fiber and insoluble fiber may actually help with some gastrointestinal side effects as well as smaller, more frequent meals. One thing that's not talked about a ton is that the GLP-1 receptor agonists tend to decrease thirst, and so patients may also be dehydrated, and so hydration may also help with constipation in that patient group. When it comes to micronutrients, uh, obesity has actually been established to have certain risk factors for different vitamin deficiencies, especially with vitamin D. Um, whereas GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy, and, and anytime somebody goes onto a very low calorie diet, right? Like that's what these medications help people do. They help them re dramatically reduce their calorie intake. Um, this is actually kind of similar to a vertical sleeve gastrectomy, which is a type of bariatric surgery. But anytime we have people on very low calorie diets, there are some specific things to look out for, specifically vitamin A, D, E, C, B vitamins, calcium, magnesium, zinc, and perhaps you can even throw iron into there, especially thinking about you have a predominantly female patient population here. And then weight loss maintenance. You know, we talked about like what happens when people discontinue either by choice or not by choice uh, using these medications, and they do tend to regain a significant portion of their body weight. And so to my knowledge, there's actually only one study that's even approached this and, and looked at this, and this was a, a study of around intensive lifestyle intervention uh, combined with carbohydrate restriction, and they found that the patient population who was deprescribing GLP-1s um, were actually able to maintain their weight loss when combined with carbohydrate restriction. So that is my section, and now I'm going to hand it over to Kristen, who's going to take us through some specific case studies and how she coaches her patients who are using these medications. Thank you so much, Dr. John. Uh, so we got a really great summary from Dr. John, really about looking at what are some of the main issues, and, and muscle loss is a big one. I mean, looking at that stat, about 40% lean mass being lost, uh, that's a real concern that I see with my patients. So we're going to go through some case studies today, and I'm going to go into it just a little bit more detail into the goals of dietary management, what I'm going over with my patients. Uh, and people that I know that are on some of these drugs. So obviously maintenance of muscle mass is gonna be at the forefront of our conversation. That's gonna be really important because of the fact that when these individuals either get off the drug or they dose down, and I'll talk about that in one of my case studies, um, we tend to see that they could put weight back on. So if we're losing a lot of lean muscle mass, right? And then we gain weight, we're gonna gain weight a lot easier. And this is where the fear comes in that, oh, we're going to gain so much more than we actually lost. So that's going to be at the forefront. Uh, Dr. John talked about nutrient density and, you know, looking at those avoidance of nutritional deficiencies. I tell my patients, you are going to be engaging in a very low calorie diet. That means you're not going to be eating that much. And that means that we need to get bang for every nutritional bite. So I had a patient once tell me, oh, you know, this this is great because I don't eat that much and I just had a bag of gummy bears when I want some energy. Now that's not a great option because that, 
bag of gummy bears is not going to give any nutrient density. So that's a big one. Managing and reducing the, that GI side effect. So how do we do that with fiber? How do we add fiber in while still getting enough protein? Fueling the why. The why is really important. I think sometimes as, as dietitians, we have people coming in and saying, well, I, I want to lose 20 pounds or I, you know, I just, I want to fit into this dress for my son's wedding. And that becomes their why. But when we look at studies, it's very clear that a weight loss why is not sustainable. Once we lose the weight, once we hit that magic number, we don't really have the motivation to go on. So what I look for is what is the why outside of weight loss? I have a lot of patients that are doing this because they have a history of Alzheimer's in their family. Um, they have a history of type 2 diabetes in their family. That's a little bit more of a meaningful why. So I do encourage you to always look at what is the why beyond just getting into a lower gene size, because that's the why I get all the time, lower gene size, right? So let's go a little bit beyond that to see what we can do that's more sustainable. And then, of course, the easier transition after we get off these drugs, if we get off these drugs. And then finally, adherence to cultural, religious, and personal preferences. You know, if you give your patients a dietary plan that has a whole bunch of kale and chicken, and that patient doesn't like those two foods, they won't stick with it. They're going to end up going with something else. So really kind of tapping into what that looks like for your patient population. Let's go a little bit more into the benefits of protein. We know we have plenty of data looking at the benefit in terms of satiation. So on a per calorie basis, protein has the most satiating benefit here. When we have protein, whether we're on the drug or not, we feel satisfied, we feel full. So protein helps in that aspect in addition to lowering uh, blood sugar management, improvements in blood sugar management, and then of course, going into that muscle mass and avoidance of weight gain after. So when and how much, right? So this is the question. Uh, Dr. John had said that really we should be consuming protein throughout the day. And that is what we see consistently with the studies. Uh, some of the studies referenced here look at as, as, as large as 1.2 to 1.6 grams of protein per, per kilogram and being meal specific. So when we see that we're getting protein in every single meal, every single snack, we know that there's better adherence to body weight management, cardio metabolic risk factors, um, and other health outcomes. And then the how much. So the how much is going to be dependent on a lot of different factors, obviously. So when we think about protein, we have to look at exercise level, gender, uh, what are some of the risk factors we have? Do we have someone with renal dysfunction? So we have to look at all those aspects too, but we do see that even a higher amount, let's go back to something like 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilogram, um, can be very effective for extreme obesity when we look at weight loss. So I always tell my patients, hey, let's think about anytime you're going to eat something, where can we get a small or large amount of protein in it based on whether it's going to be a meal, a snack, or what I've been talking about with my patients, which is a micro meal. Many of my patients, they're, we're going to focus on eating small frequent meals throughout the day. And so the protein could be consistent throughout each and every meal and snack. Um, and that's a micro meal perspective. Uh, it, could, it should also be high quality protein. So I can't stress that enough. Obviously, essential amino acids are the nine amino acids your body can't make on their own. We need them from diet. And then the branch chain amino acids are going to be those groups of essential amino acids that we know are tied to better muscle metabolism. So a hot dog would not be really considered a high quality protein source, but perhaps beans and legumes, perhaps getting some chicken, some wild fish, that would be considered high quality. So again, I go back to the importance that we are getting nutritional bang for every single bite. We are no longer in a place where we can have food that doesn't provide any nutrient density. We are eating so much less when we're on these drugs so that we really have to adhere to that. We also don't want to forget about healthy fats. Uh, in addition to the, the, satiating, the satiation that we get from protein, we know that fats do the same as well. And we also know that if we look at high fat diets, despite the fact that fat has nine calories per gram and it's got more calories than our other macronutrients, it's not associated generally with weight gain. And, you know, when we look at the studies, that could have a lot to do with the reaction of insulin, et cetera, that we're not getting and the reduction of carbohydrates. Um, but we also know that 
healthy fats can help improve physical strength as well. It's typically not a benefit that we think about when we think about healthy fats. We think about physical strength and we think about protein and muscle, but we have several studies looking at uh, benefits to strength. And then of course, brain health is a big one as well, attention, um, all really important. Now, I will caution that very high fat meals and especially fried foods, so real fatty foods, could increase some of the GI symptoms that we see in some of the patients. And that goes along with really the mechanism of the drug. These foods, they're, we have a slowed gastric emptying. So they're going into our, the stomach and they're kind of living there for a while. They're not really moving through the way they normally would if you're not on the drug. So when we have a very high fat meal, especially before bed, um, that can really lead to some more gastric distress. And then, of course, fiber. So we talk so much about protein, and, and we should, right? I mean, for all the reasons that Dr. John covered in those clinical trials, protein is clearly going to help with the maintenance of the muscle mass, avoidance of losing lean muscle mass. But when we think about fiber, fiber is going to be a really big key in terms of the constipation that we typically see. So we had already seen in some of the previous studies that some of the main adverse GI effects that we can see is going to be constipation and diarrhea. So those are going to be two big ones. Now, when we look at uh, some of the data from Wharton et al., we know that about 99.5% of our constipation and some of the GI side effects are typically non-serious, but 98% are mild to moderate. And most of these side effects occur after or during that dose escalation. So you, you might see this with your patient that they start at a very low dose to assess tolerance. And then after three weeks, they bump it up. And then after three weeks, they bump it up again. And that really is to kind of assess well, what is the highest dose we can go on where we don't have this GI upset. Uh, despite that, we do have an average, average onset of 47 days with constipation versus 35 days with placebo. Um, what kind of fibers should we be looking at for our patients here? So soluble fiber tends to be the most beneficial for diarrhea and constipation. And then if it's just constipation, insoluble fiber tends to be something that can be really effective. Uh, I will tell you, and you might see this in the case studies, many of the patients I see have a combination of the two. So what I'm typically seeing is that they will be constipated, but then when they increase their, but whenever they're going to increase that dose, that's typically the day where diarrhea might come in. Um, so, it, you know, they might change their symptom based on when their dose was. So that's really important to take, to take leave up. And then adequate hydration, uh, we already talked about this a little bit. I'm going to show you a study in the next slide. And then physical activity. So physical activity is going to be so important for our patients as they're on these drugs because we want to incorporate the lifestyle change, not, the, not just the pharmacological change, but the lifestyle change. Physical activity is part of this, but we also know that physical activity helps to actually move bowel through the system. So that's another thing we have to look at in terms of constipation. Your patients, and I've seen this in my population, might be tempted to simply say, I'm just going to take a fiber supplement. But these are some of the things we can look at instead. Let's look at the different types of fiber that we're looking at naturally, hydration, physical activity. Uh, and we already covered this briefly, but I, it's, I found this to be really fascinating looking at these studies. We know that these GLP-1R drugs suppress appetite, okay? So that's an obvious. We didn't really think that they suppress thirst as well, but now we see some, some data that they do. So we know that there's a risk of dehydration that obviously leads to a higher risk for constipation, but dehydration can also be risk factor for other adverse um, health effects as well. Uh, older patients tend to be more at risk for these, and then obviously those living in hot climates can also be at risk. So the recommendation that we're seeing from the data is about two to three liters of fluid per day, and that amounts to about nine plus cups of water. Um, so they, they do recommend getting it from beverages, but again, as dietitians, we know that you can get hydration from many different sources. 
So that could be from very hydrating fruits and vegetables. That could be from consuming milk. Uh, that could be from having cottage cheese. That could be from having decaf coffee or decaf tea. Okay, so um, there's a lot of ways that we can recommend individuals avoid the risk of dehydration. Uh, just as, doesn't have to be water, but again, working with our patients to determine what that right step is. Let's talk a little bit about weight regain. Uh, I feel like when someone talks to me on day one about their desire to be on one of these drugs, in the same conversation, they're talking about their fear of gaining all the weight back. Uh, so this is a, a, a real huge component when we see our patients. So let's just look at this slide for a moment. We know that there is a lot of benefit to weight loss. We know that when we lose 10% of our, our body weight, then our lipids tend to improve, blood sugar tends to improve. Um, all of these things improve. When our patients go through this and they see improvements in their numbers, once they get off the drug, if they regain the weight, those improvements will most likely go away. They might see that their LDL is going up again. They might see their hemoglobin A1C is going up again. So if we look at this as a game changer, and that's what a lot of dietitians that I work with say, these drugs are a game changer, right? Like my patient has been trying to lose weight for so long, has been unsuccessful in doing it, but now this drug is really facilitating that. Um, we have to also remember that all of these benefits, a lot, a lot of the time, come alongside the drug. And I say that because I've had patients that will say, I'm feeling great. All my numbers are normal now. I've lost weight. I'm going to get off the drug now. And so, again, how do we take that next step of maybe dosing down or working with their physician of what that looks like. So typically this will come at the, at the decision of the, the medical team, of course, not just the dietitian, um, but it's a really important factor to look at because we do see a lot of cardiometabolic benefits to these patients that um, are going through some of these regimens. Getting off these regimens, do, do, does it completely negate that? So we'll have to see. Okay, for my case studies, I really wanted to show all walks of life. Um, we are seeing people come in who are on a compounded semaglutide. We know compounded versions are not FDA approved. Okay, but we see a lot of that. So let's just look at a few case studies and then how I am treating this within my patient base as well. So Rebecca is a, a great one to start with and probably due to my bias, I think she's a great one to start with because she's a dietitian. Uh, she's a pediatric dietitian, 49 year old Hispanic female and perimenopausal. Now, Rebecca did not come in with the goal of I want to be on some glutide. That was not the first thing that she thought of. Uh, she was actually having coffee with another dietitian at a conference, and she was talking about her weight gain, belly fat. Her hormones were all completely out of control. She hadn't had a menstrual period in about um, 10 months at that point. And so her friend, another dietitian, had said, I work with this doctor who's a female uh, hormone doctor out of this state, and she has physicians that pre can prescribe all over the United States. I'm going to set up a call with you. She can put you on some glutide. You're going to lose weight. You're going to feel great. She'll do all this blood work. Okay. So that's exactly where she went. So Rebecca went that route, but there was no lifestyle recommendation. It was essentially just, let's take some labs um, and here's the drug. And then here's how you're going to do the dosing. Okay. So she started working with me. Uh, as far as the lifestyle component. So let's just start with where her labs were at the beginning of this. Uh, 165 pounds, so Rebecca's BMI is about 25.8. So really, she's, she was absolutely accurate. She said, I just want to lose a little bit of weight. But really, her why, because we did go over that, was more about her numbers. So yes, she was maybe very slightly overweight, if you could say that, but it was really her LDL that she was very concerned about. She also had elevated liver enzymes, um, and her big why was this family history of Alzheimer's disease. So she had uh, one copy of the Apio4 gene. She had been doing the MIND diet for years. She had tried everything to lose the belly fat. Uh, her hormones were out of control, and literally she said, I don't want to turn into my mother. 
because her mother died of Alzheimer's disease and she saw her go through that. Uh, she also had normal thyroid function. That's a really important factor here because we know that one of the risk factors for some of these drugs um, could be thyroid nodules, thyroid cancer. Um, and so you, you have to go through that lab work as well. So here's where we started with Rebecca when she came and then she was prescribed a, a four month protocol. Now, when you see someone coming in to your office or you know someone who is on a compounded version of these drugs, um, a lot of times what will happen is they will get a vial of the liquid, which is what Rebecca got, and they'll get a whole bunch of insulin syringes, right? And they'll be measured in terms of units, okay? So one to three weeks, she's at the lowest dose. That's 10 units. And then if that's tolerated, which it should be, then we move up to 20 units four to six weeks. Now, typically what we see is from the 20 units, it's bumped up to 40 units. And just to give you uh, some perspective here, Ozempic is typically prescribed in 0.51 or two milligram doses. 40 units is one milligram. So it's right in the middle of where that would be, okay? Um, she had like really tolerable, but she was kind of fearful of some of her nausea, uh, diarrhea, constipation that she had with 30 units, especially when she escalated the dose. So those first two days, she just, just did not like how she felt. She said she felt icky. And so she actually chose never to go to the 40 unit mark. She is sticking with that 30 unit and she's paying out of pocket. So um, she couldn't get insurance to cover it. This is one of the, the, the attractiveness of some of these compounding pharmacies um, is this cheaper rate that you can get. So $400 per month is what she's paying. Uh, in terms of some of the benefits to her personally, right? So looking at this personalized medicine approach, we do know that uh, type two diabetes and chronic liver disease outcomes can be potentially reduced on a GLP-1 R drug. So there's benefit there. And we did see improvements in her liver enzymes you'll see at the end of this. And then there's really fascinating data that we're seeing right now with Alzheimer's risk and some of these drugs. So we've seen um, quite a few pieces of data with some aglutide. You may have seen on the news two weeks ago um, that there was another piece of data coming out about liraglutide reducing Alzheimer's risk. And we need a lot more studies. There's no doubt about that. But if we look at Alzheimer's and the progression of Alzheimer's, um, Alzheimer's can develop 20 years prior to symptoms. And we know that it has to do with deposits, uh, deposits of um, tau and beta. And we know that these are things that build up in the brain. And over time, we start seeing more of this cognitive decline symptoms, et cetera. It would be really interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we will see more studies coming out about this, whether or not these drugs, uh, number one, actually help to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's, right? We don't have a cure for this. We have some meds, but we don't have a cure. And then number two, this is the real question, do these patients stay on these drugs lifelong? Do they stay in that plateau phase? So what does that look like? Really interesting, and I'm sure more data to come. Her diet and exercise prescription, uh, something she and I worked on together. So frequent small meals, optimizing that protein, high quality protein, hydration, uh, we did look at supplementation, and again, she's on a very low-calorie diet, so she's going to be missing things, but the supplementation also fit in with that Alzheimer's risk. So for her, specifically, omega-3s was something very big, uh, magnesium. Uh, she was really good at resistance training, biking. She completely avoided alcohol, which was, which was great. Um, she wasn't a big drinker, but she said that that made her feel really wonderful. And after four months on the medication, uh, she was losing about 1.5 pounds per week, and she had about a 24-pound weight loss. So she was very happy about that. Her hemoglobin A1C came down as well, no longer in that pre-diabetic phase. LDL came down, normal liver enzymes. HDL did go down, which is not uncommon to see when we see someone losing 24 pounds. Um, typically, what we see in the data, though, is that over time, uh, once you are in the weight maintenance phase, those, LD, those HDL levels should come back to normal. Okay, someone, uh, we were just, I was just looking at the questions and people were asking, you know, is it really gender specific? Are more women on this than men? I have one man on this uh, drug, and, and this is him. So this is Jeremy, and most of my patients are women. 
Um, so Jeremy is a pharmacist. He had been working with me for at least five to six years, and he's very motivated. He is very compliant, diet, exercise, really hasn't been working to change his numbers too much. His weight loss has been really, really slow. So uh, he really got hit the jackpot because we got this whole team of uh, allied health professionals and his endocrinologist, and we are all working with him on his protocol um, to, to do this. So he started with semaglutide. He started and switched to uh, trisepatide. And his beginning dose was about one uh, milligram. So he started in 2023. Um, for his dietary perspective here, what he really focused on was plant-based. So this was a great example. Jerry's a great example of how you can take that protein, high quality protein, and put it more into plants. He does have some chicken and some pork added in, but they're pretty infrequent, I would say. Um, maybe once, maybe twice a week. He works out. Uh, he's very attentive to fiber, probably because he's really focusing on those plants. Um, and he focuses on adequate but not excessive protein and then hydration. So again, we don't have to go super high with the protein content. He's been pretty successful just looking at um, more of a moderate level. So he's uh, finished his 21st dose. And he's had improvements in all of his lab values. I asked him the other day, what is your biggest complaint? Constipation is the, the largest one. He did plateau uh, around June at 230 pounds, and he started adding in a little bit more exercise, but significant improvements, and he's happier. So that was one thing that I looked at, and he's, he's happier, and that makes a huge difference. In terms of plateau management, uh, you know, you want to look at interaction with other medications. Some medications can uh, make the plateau worse or, or benefit. Uh, lifestyle management, do we need to add in more weight training? Do we add, need to add in something else? Combination therapy, are we going, is the endocrinologist gonna look at maybe another drug in addition to what he's doing? And then the dose management, would he tolerate a higher dose to see if that plateau comes down? Okay, Tia is a 33-year-old stay-at-home mom. She, her motivation of, of using this for weight loss was with GI issues. She said that she had all these GI issues, which was interesting why she chose to go on one of these drugs, which can increase that. Um, and she was sick and tired of obsessing about her weight. So she started with this, ended up in the ER, and then found a physician and then ended up on Sexenda. So she switched to liraglutide um, and currently has been on that for two months. So throughout her entire journey, so this is going back to like February, she went from 168 to 135 pounds. Uh, this is a great example of someone who started on one drug and then ended up with another drug. So again, you might have to look at different uh, variations of this drug. Uh, in, in terms of things that I thought was interesting with her, so she is examining a maintenance dose. What could she be on right now? And she said that uh, the danger was the goal weight after, she said that was the moving target. So she got to 135 and now she's thinking, well, maybe I could be 125. So kind of working through that. And she also felt, felt very superficial. So I thought that was interesting, the superficialness of it. She's hiding it from people. Um, and that I see that very commonly. People that are just saying, oh, no, I'm eating better and I'm doing all this working out. And they, they still don't want to tell people that they're on this. Okay. Um, Margo. So Margo is a really interesting case at normal weight. She acquired this from a friend. So her friend happened to have this. She gave this to Margo. She started at 24 BMI. So she's not overweight at all. Drinks a lot of wine. And she has been being put by her friend on much higher doses than what is normal. Now, she complains a lot of uh, GI distress. So there's, there's, there's no doubt that it's not, it's not doing well for her in terms of those contraindications um, and GI ex, uh, distress that she's getting. But the real problem with Margot is that she is becoming um, really spiraling into disordered eating and she is very underweight. The only benefit I could see from Margot right now is the alcohol. She really has stopped drinking alcohol. And again, just have we have some really promising data on Alzheimer's, we have promising data. Are these drugs going to be effective 
for individuals who have addictive behaviors like alcoholism. Um, but she does have that disordered eating that is definitely going on. And I think we're going to see a little bit more data on this as well. Once people are getting to this, these very thin levels, um, we're either seeing an emergence or a re-emergence of disordered eating. So that should be really something to think about before we start having this conversation with your patients. Is there a history of disordered eating here? Um, and then finally, the weight regain. So when, what we do know is that the weight regain is going to be variable based on a lot of different lifestyle factors. Um, you know, some of the large studies do say that individuals regain two thirds of their body weight after a year. So that's, that's a, that's a big chunk, and that's what I started with this part of my presentation. That's the fear that we have. But we also know that when we add exercise and regular lifestyle dietary patterns, we can have a lot of benefit to that as well. I'm going to turn it back to John to do some conclusions, and then we'll take some questions. Yeah, thank you, Kristen, and thank you for the excellent case studies. Very, very informative. So just kind of as some conclusions, you know, I think it's pretty clear right now from the clinical trials that have been done that the GLP-1 receptor agonists are, are quite effective for reducing caloric intake. They work through multiple mechanisms, which if you're familiar with obesity medicine, there are multiple phenotypes of obesity kind of indicating that they might be helpful for a much broader range of population than some of the past anti-obesity medications. Kristen talked a lot about the nutritional recommendations and how we kind of account for different patients and what their needs might be. Um, but it is really important to just start off with the foundation of these patients are eating a lot less. We need to really prioritize high quality nutrition, protein, vitamins, and minerals. Um, very, very important, as well as making sure they're staying hydrated. And then I think it's also important just to evaluate the fact that, that there's not a homogenous response to these medications. There's very individual responses, and many different medications, especially in the next 10 years, that will be on the market. So patients are going to be having different experiences with different medications, and it makes your job as a dietitian a little bit more complicated because you're going to have to start teasing apart things in a more nuanced fashion. But really appreciate everyone's attendance today, and we're going to answer some of the questions that were submitted in the chat. Excellent. Thank you both so much. The questions are coming in fast and furious. John, we had been sort of texting um, during the conversation here, and there were a lot of questions about protein. Can you just provide some additional clarity kind of across the board for those folks asking about protein? Yeah, certainly, and that's a great question. So um, when it comes to protein recommendations, what is kind of thought to be one of the best ways to do it for people who have overweight or obesity is actually to calculate kind of their ideal body weight or a reference body weight for them where you take their height and give them a target BMI, 25, 26, and say, okay, what does that person need to be at from a body weight standpoint to get a BMI around that area? And then use that target reference body weight to calculate your grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. So there's a, a paper by that we have referenced in here on one of our protein slides that actually shows all of that information and how you can use that to not overdo your protein, but also not underdo your protein. Perfect. Um, this question for Kristen, we were talking about this before we went live, um, but, and you touched on this in your last couple of slides, do you think these meds are contributing to a fear of food, a fear of weight gain, eating disorders? Um, someone else in the Q&A mentioned orthorexia, just the obsession with eating healthfully, um, you know, and that kind of help, contributing to maybe a spiraling of weight loss that becomes unhealthy. So any, any further comment, Kristen, and maybe also you, Dr. John, on the, um, the sort of fear of food factor that is uh, going on here? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. One of the um, patients that I have who was not a case study, she went off the drug. Um, so she first she lowered the dose, then she went off the drug, and she put on um, maybe seven pounds. I think she had lost a total of 30 pounds. And the second she lost those seven pounds, she was right back on the drug. So it was really interesting. Uh, you know, this really speaks to kind of are we seeing the disordered eating aspect of 
we have someone who lost the weight, uh, may, maybe lost a little bit too much weight. We do, we do see that side of it as well, but really liked it, liked the, liked the feeling of it, liked the attention, maybe not even looking at lab work, and then would just do anything not to put that weight back on. So I think part of it is personality driven. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, but I do think it's a big concern, and I feel like a lot of people that I work with don't think about that. So when we think about like, what's the questionnaire for someone who comes in and says, I really want to be on one of these drugs. We ask about thyroid and pancreatic function. Very few people when I'm looking at this ask, do you have a history of disordered eating? But I think it's a question we do have to ask because, you know, we are taking people who are losing weight, like they've never been able to before. And there's a lot of benefit in their head to that. And they have this huge fear of gaining the weight back. So their body image, all of these things can kind of change. Um, and in some ways, you know, even though I, I, I don't like the word clean eating, but if we could take that word clean eating and orthorexia, which I think sometimes goes hand in hand, um, you know, really taking the concept of it and just making it about nutrient density, not clean, not you know, not being so stringent, but making it about nutrient density. That's a better way for us to communicate that um, versus, you know, let's make sure everything's organic. I think that can just contribute to some of these issues. Excellent. Fair enough. We are at the top of the hour. I'm going to put the credit claiming slide up for those of you who have to leave us um, due to scheduling. Um, here's the instructions to claim credit, but I want to keep going with a few more questions because we've got a, a lot of good ones in here. Um, so, Dr. John, back to you. What's your opinion or can you comment on these G, uh, GLP-1 probiotics uh, or the over-the-counter sort of supplemental um, weight loss drugs? We're seeing a lot of these pushed on social media and um, some smaller pharmacies are pushing them because they're OTC rather than requiring a prescription. What's your feeling on that and what's your sort of, you know, scientific uh, approach to addressing patients that have questions on these things? Yeah, um, I'm going to answer this and try to not sound too cynical, um, but certainly the word GLP-1 has now entered popular nomenclature. You know, GLP-1 is a hormone we've known about for 50 years, but now it's all of a sudden a common word that people know, and I think there are some people out there trying to capitalize on its popularity. No matter what supplement or probiotic you take, you're talking about increasing endogenous GLP-1, like I said, that only lasts in the body for a couple of minutes. It's really rapidly degraded. So that compared to semaglutide, terzepatide, which lasts 160 hours, it's like 2,000 times longer. Um, it, it's a little misleading. Certainly they do increase, like the probiotics, they probably do increase GLP-1, but is there actually any clinically meaningful benefit from it? I'm less certain of that. Got it. Excellent. What about these um, compounded versions? They seem to be, I mean, we're, we're sort of getting different and maybe conflicting information. Sometimes they lead to some significant side effects. And Kristen, to your case study, um, Tia, who had some pretty intense um, side effects um, taking the real thing, right? So the, the compounded right. version seems to be pretty dangerous. So any comments or recommendations on how to advise patients on those? Yeah, well, I think number one, I think we have to keep in mind that they're not FDA approved. That's number one. But number two, I think there's a huge chunk of people um, that are on these compounded versions for, for two different reasons. Number one, because of cost. So if you compare, let's say, Saxenda or Ozempic, uh, if you have to pay out of pocket, and let's say you're going to be paying fifteen, sixteen hundred a month, versus the $400 a month for the compounded version, that's really attractive for people that feel, I need to lose weight, I can't afford, I can't afford the, um, you know, the regular version. So that's kind of number one. The other thing that we're seeing is you're more, much more likely, and here's one of the huge risks. Number one, we, obviously we don't know what's in the compounded version. So we don't know what else is in there. Um, number two though, most of the really significant adverse health effects that we see in the data is coming from misdosing. So if you remember with Rebecca, I showed you get those, you get that insulin syringe and then you get the vial. 
Um, and it assumes that Rebecca knows how to measure the liquid in the syringe and take the amount. But we've seen in a lot of data on ER visits, things like that, some people will take three to four times what they're supposed to take because they simply didn't dose correctly. So some of the benefits of the, the, the FDA-approved pharmacological agents are that it's very hard to misdose. I mean, you, you click it or whatever the, the, the mechanism is. Um, it's very easy to miss dose with the compounded version. So I don't think they're going to go away. They're so popular. And I don't think we have a good grasp on to what is a reputable, good compounding pharmacy versus a bad one. We don't have that answer because so many of them are popping up. So I always say, listen, if you can, if you can get insurance to cover this, if you can afford it, I would always recommend the FDA approved option. Um, but as a dietitian, if I have a, someone coming to me for dietary guidance and they're on a compounded version and they're not getting off of it, I probably won't encourage them to, to get off of it because I just know they won't, uh, especially if they're seeing success. Right, right. That's, that's totally fair. Um, all right. So last question, um, and I want to start with you, Dr. John. Um, the studies that you mentioned in your portion of the presentation, were they completed in combination with possibly or maybe at least low intensity exercise and lifestyle changes or were the results seen just from the effects of the medication? And I picked this question as the last one because I think it, it basically goes to the, the education we're delivering here, right? These, these drugs are not necessarily a magic pill. Um, there might be some, there are some other things that need, patients need to do that Kristen addressed and that you addressed, Dr. John, exercise, lifestyle change, eating right, getting good nutrients, um, but wondering if the studies consider that as part of uh, the data that they're presenting. Yeah, so that, that's actually a great question, and I should have mentioned that it's a very light-touch lifestyle intervention with some recommendations around reducing calories, increasing physical activity. Um, there's not a lot of data of like what was actually followed by the patient, so it's hard to tell how much of their lifestyles changed or how much was driven by the medication. But what has actually been seen, there was several trials where they combined the medication with intensive lifestyle interventions and found that that combination wasn't that much more effective than just the medication alone, suggesting the medication itself drives a lot of the weight loss. So for me, the opportunity for dietitians and nutrition educators is really around how do we make that weight loss as quality as possible so that the patient has the best outcome that they can possibly have. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, both of you, Dr. John and Kristen, for being here today and for sharing your expertise on what we know is such an important topic. There was a lot of excitement about today's presentation, and we're really glad you could join us. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we've come to the end of the webinar. Your attendance certificates should be available to download in the CE Learning Library. You can follow the instructions on the screen or refer to this final slide of the presentation handout for information on how to complete the evaluation and then access your certificate. You and I wish everyone a great rest of your day.